Hello everybody, it's Dimpner here with this week's Intelligent Property Investor Masterclass. Great to be with you guys again. Um, I'm still on the boat as you can see, <laughs> but I will be very soon back on my farm. So coming to you this week, uh, there's a lot of news. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, the world has simply gone crazy, especially here in Australia. While Europe seems to be opening up and, and doing normal things, so too does America, Australia is lagging behind, probably due to the fact that we're in winter and they're in summer. Partly that anyway. But let's get into what impact that actually has on our economy and what it means from our property, what it means for our future investing and the types of things that we should be doing right now in order to really advantage us into the future. Because we're in a cycle right now where the um, the property market is on the way up and will continue to be so. If you think we're in the, the top of the bubble, we're not. And I've got some figures this week to show you all of that as well. Look, this week, um, I want to really focus on what you guys need to be doing because, you know, you can sit back, you can wait, you can, um, you can prophesize about what's going to happen and you can live in fear, which is what a lot of people are doing right now. And I know it's hard if you're in lockdown and, and uh, you know, you're not allowed out, you're not allowed to get takeaway and all these kind of things. But the reality is there's a lot you can do. And I'll share with you a couple of stories of what some of my students have been able to do in the middle of lockdown. So don't use lockdown as an excuse to hold you back. Now, if you're listening to this as a podcast, either on Spotify or on iTunes, I do share with you a lot of charts, which you might like to see. And if you'd like to see those charts and the full description of everything, along with a bit of a, a manual that goes with it, I'd like you to go to my website. It's iloverealestate.tv and you can view all the information there and uh, or you can go to my Facebook page or on uh, YouTube. It's all there for you as well. So let's get into this week's Intelligent Property Investor Masterclass. So let me just share my screen with you for a moment and we'll get into it. All right. Now, this week, what are we going to be covering? Well, the headline story is, will the Sydney and Melbourne lockdowns crash the Australian property markets? It's something that's probably been on the, uh, the, you know, the tip of your tongues, the top of your worry list, if you like. But I want to share with you some facts as to why that's actually not going to be the case. I'm also going to be covering, is the consumer confidence going to kill the COVID recovery? and why Brisbane and Perth are the two cities to watch for accelerated growth in the next 12 months. And which little country is having a massive impact on the Australian property market? Something you might not realize going on there. And why the richer you are, the less likely you are to get a divorce. So just a bit of fun to finish off on there. Look, if you tune into mainstream media, if you turn the, the news on in the morning, you watch the morning shows or you watch the evening news or any of that kind of stuff, this is what you see. You see a whole bunch of politicians um, carrying on about COVID rates and death rates and new case numbers and lockdowns. And, you know, we, this is actually really brought to the fore something that I think is wrong with our constitution and that is that we are state run when it comes to something on a health basis because the states control our hospitals the states control our um, our health and our health departments the states have the power old scomo that you see there basically can't do a goddamn thing no matter what he does the states can overrule it for their particular states and you've got all of these these uh state leaders you know pumping their chests and and uh you know saying putting the other one down and all this kind of stuff and there is nothing that our federal government can do this is something that if you go back a few years, you'd look at and go, it's impossible. You know, the, the federal government runs the country and they dish out the money and all of those kind of things. But look what's happening now. You know, we, we aren't Australia anymore. We are a bunch of individual states. And uh, depending on what state you live in, depends on what the rules are. So 
it's very, very controversial. And that's actually causing quite a bit of angst amongst the states. And it's also causing quite a bit of movement amongst the states. You're seeing a lot of movement from those areas that are in major lockdown to those areas which aren't in huge lockdowns and haven't been in huge lockdowns. And that's causing um, a, a bit of a, a push in the property market as well, because what we're seeing is that states like WA and Queensland, there's a lot of people moving to those states because uh, they haven't had the lockdowns, they haven't had the case studies, they had the cases, they haven't had any of those things. And that's creating higher demand in some areas and lower demand in other areas. However, having said that, demand right across the board for housing, which is rentals and purchasing, is way above what we have from a supply chain perspective. And that supply chain perspective and why it is so low, it goes back to a story that started back in 2017. And in 2017, we had a massive um, surge in property prices. It was mainly being driven by a lot of overseas investment and speculation. Now, APRA got themselves involved, which is the governing body that controls the banks. They got themselves involved and said, this is you know, creating a, a, a big storm in the market and we need to cool it because it's dangerous for the country. So what they did is they stepped in, they put a whole bunch of rules on the, on the banks and that in turn caused a downturn in the economy. It caused the big boys to stop building new dwellings. It caused a slowdown in the construction industry. And one of the industries that really, um, uh, what makes the economy go round is the construction industry. If you want to affect the, if you want to affect the economy at large, the biggest industry that creates the biggest amount of impact is the construction industry. It employs more people than the manufacturing and the mining industries combined. So uh, they crushed it. They killed it. APRA killed the country basically back then. And we had this decline through to the, towards the latter half of 2019. So supply really, really went down. Now that caused um, as demand to be much higher than supply. And we really haven't recovered from that. COVID-19 came in, in in 2020 and that exacerbated the situation. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, the rollout of that. So while supply is starting to come up, and I'll share some figures with you there, uh, we, we still have demand massively over supply right across the board. However, when you start to look at the individual states, those states that haven't experienced massive shutdowns and lockdowns are getting a surge of uh, population increase. Some of it is temporary where you've got the grey nomads living in their caravans and those sorts of things or on their boats as I'm experiencing. Um, you've also got the permanent uh, movement where people are moving to those areas where they just they just want a life. They don't want to be in lockdown and those things. So it's causing this uh, big rift between, uh, you know, between the states and I I can't see an end to it. Uh, unless we had a constitutional change, we'd have to have a referendum to do that and a constitutional change to give the, uh, the control back to the federal government. Um, I can't see it changing. And we, we, are, we really are living in little mini different countries right now within the thing that we call Australia. And I don't like it. I actually don't like it. But anyway, that's my opinion. You can have your own opinion on that one. The thing that, that I think we need to take stock of here is fear is the real killer, not coronavirus. You know, the fact that we are fearful, we are living in fear, we are living in in a society where, you know, somebody sneezes and, and you know, we, we think that we're going to die because somebody sneezed. Um, and we, you know, we are locking ourselves away in fear. So I'm not I'm not putting down the coronavirus. I'm not putting down the health issues. I'm not doing any of those things. But fear is very real and fear affects your thoughts and fear affects your emotions and your emotions affect the chemical reactions that happen in your body and the neuropeptides that you've got running around your system and your neuro pathways and your energy levels and your vibrational frequency and all of these things come into play. And when you're in fear, you don't function. When you're in fear, your body goes into protection mode and it can't heal it can't do the normal things that it wants to do 
So I, you know, you tune into mainstream media and all you see is the coronavirus. Um, and it's depression that is a big, big factor in this whole thing. No, it may not be killing people, but by gee, it's having a massive impact. You look at this chart here and you can see, admittedly, this was last year, but we're in the same position this year as we were June last year, except the, the, the big case numbers happen to be in New South Wales rather than in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Victoria. But look at the numbers of depression compared to, uh, you know, a year ago. So in 2019, before we even knew what the word coronavirus was or COVID-19 or any of those things, we had the different levels of depression across the, the lower um, age groups, middle age groups and the older age groups. But look where they are now, you know, massively, massively higher, particularly in the younger age group. And then again, in the, in the higher age group, double what they were pre-pandemic, pre-COVID-19. Pre and, and this is this is worrying because when your body goes into fear and it goes into depression and it goes into to um, you know creating hormones in your body that are not advantageous to life, a whole stream of other things kick into gear which do not serve you. So I want you to start watching your thought patterns. I want you to start monitoring your words. I want you to 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 be aware of what stimuli you allowing into your um you know into your life because if you listen to mainstream media you are going to be sick <laughs> with just the uh you know the the whole um bad news story that's going on and there's plenty of good news stories there's plenty of things that you can do you know this this whole um, coronavirus thing that we're, we're in right now, it's actually created an enormous amount of opportunities. There's opportunities to make money in other fields. There's opportunities to, to, to get into property um, while you're in a lockdown. There's opportunities. And one of my students, I'll just tell you this quickly, even though I'm gonna feature it next, next week. One of my students just comes to mind where uh, in the middle of a lockdown, unable to leave her house, bought a property which only cost $140,000, wasn't a big, big expensive property. I'm not talking about a Sydney or a Melbourne property, but this property um, with what she's done to the property has created a 40, nearly $40,000 passive income. Now that's, that's a wage for some people, you know, buy two of them and you're, you know, you're home and hosed. So you can use the lockdowns to your advantage or you can go and order I suppose in some places you can't even order a pizza um, and home delivered alcohol, but you know you can get fat and happy, at, fat and depressed at home, or you can actually use the uh, the opportunity to get out there, do something with your life, and uh, and invest in property, learn, get yourself educated. This is the perfect opportunity to do that. It's the perfect opportunity to upskill. And if you upskill in the, in the area of real estate, you've got more opportunity to put that into, into practice. You can, you can turn your life around in such a short space of time simply by upskilling and putting that into practice. In lockdown or out of lockdown, it doesn't matter. You've got to start getting out of fear and getting into opportunity because that's when your life's going to turn around. I love this quote by Barack Obama. He says, don't shortchange the future because of fear in the present. And that's what's happening right now. People are shortchanging what is possible for them by getting stuck in the fear of what is happening right now. And that can be turned in an instant. It's a, it's a momentary decision to step up. And what I'd like to offer you is that opportunity right now. If you go to I love real estate.tv forward slash questions forward slash. I'm going to give you a gift. And that gift is a gift of knowledge. It's a gift to have an opportunity to sit down and have a consult with one of my advisors. They're 60 minutes long and they are free. And just explore the opportunities, explore the, the possibilities of what you might be able to do. And if nothing else, what it's going to do is get your head out of fear and into something more productive that's going to serve you in the future. So in the world, words of Barack Obama, don't short, short change your future 
because of fear that you're experiencing right now in the present. Anyway, I better get into the economic stuff because that's what you've come to listen to. Let's talk about consumer confidence. Um, and it is starting to slow. And the uh, what what impact is that having at the economy at large? And what impact is it having on property? And they're two very different things. So if you look at these figures here, this is the um, the the manufacturing index. So what we're seeing is there's been a little bit of a downturn from where it was, but where we were was exceptionally high. Just just take that chart out of the the page from before, and you can see here that the the uh, composite index of what's going on um, across the board in your GDP, you can see where that's running at the moment. We are lower than we have been uh, in very recent months, as in um, since the latter half of last year through to, to now. Um, but we are still heaps above where we were in the depths of COVID. So not to be, con not to be too concerned about it. It's a dip and it's a dip because of the lockdowns. If we didn't have the lockdowns, uh, that would not be happening. So, but when we look at employment, employment um, uh, is back to normal levels, basically, as to, to where that is, very similar to where we were pre-COVID. Confidence has taken, it, confidence is one of the big things that has, has caused this. And as soon as you have a change in confidence, as you can see there, um, that's when we start to have things start to, to either turn around for the better or turn around for the worse. I've marked there where the 2020 budget was, and you can see here how that budget came into play and how it, it really boosted the economy. The 2021 budget, not so much. Um, there weren't as many handouts, there weren't as, you know, the, the uptalk and whatever else. And the reason for that is pretty much what I was talking about before. Everybody's now realised that the federal government doesn't have any control. It's all the states. And the states are very, very divided on their policies, on their money, on um, on their taxing and what's going on there. I don't know where you've been listening to me for very long, but if you go back and listen to what I said about the the Victorian budget that they came out with, I was very vocal about how bad it was. Um, and and you know it varies right across the states. Some states just don't really have a policy, um, and you know that's not necessarily a good thing either. <clears throat> but this is an, this is actually interesting because this was a survey that was done at the top end of town. So this is the chief, uh, chief financial officers. So this is the big boys. And the survey showed that even though um, this was the early stages of lockdown, there was still plenty of lockdowns through New South Wales when this survey was taken, they are very optimistic. So I think it's, it's really coming down to that two-tiered society that I've been talking about for a number of weeks, where um, you know, you've got some sectors of the economy that are doing really, really, really well, and other sectors that aren't. And it's the big boys that seem to be really benefiting. Um, and I was just talking, just on an anecdotal uh, situation, I was talking to, um, to the mother of, of uh, a girl who works in the mines and just got a, a you know a, a really good bonus just because the company was doing well and you know she's not high up there she's a truck driver but uh, you know getting that bonus really boosted the morale and everything else and makes a big big difference it was a decent sized decent sized bonus as well now what this chart shows is the, and it's an extension of what i just showed you on the previous chart is that the big boys are still very bullish and you can see there um, how June 2021 compared to June 2020 as a, you know, the, the top and the bottom there, you can see there the movement uh, in, in the middle sector where even though, it, um, you know, the, uh, we're above normal people, the, the big boys believe that, that or at least 59% of the big boys believe that things are better now than normal. Um, compared to this time last year or June last year, which was 49% uh, said that we were better than normal or above average. In December, however, when things were not in lockdown, we we're actually in summer then, which is interesting, 66% uh, of the big boys believed that we were better than normal. So, uh, and you can see the other figures there, the high end. December, when we're out of lockdowns, certainly did create more of a boost. <clears throat> but when you look at the figures at large, 
they're still very much in the positive. We're not in the negative. Now, this is a, a tale of, of two things. First of all, unemployment hit um, record lows or recent record lows. There are 4.6% in July, which is down from 4.9% in June. Fantastic. How can we possibly have that when uh, most of New South Wales was in lockdown for July? <clears throat> well, here's what's going on. It's actually hiding the real situation. The true story is about the participation rate, particularly for New South Wales unemployment. So New South Wales unemployment fell by 36,000 and unemployment went up by 27,000. So why are we seeing this? Why are we seeing such low numbers if that's the case? Because unemployed stopped looking for work. So because of that participation, participation rate, we're actually seeing some false uh, readings on the unemployment rate right now. I would expect this to go up. Um, I don't think we'll stay in the fours as we move forward and we get the true figures to come out of lockdown. I think you're gonna see unemployment go up, particularly for Victoria and New South Wales, um, when the next lot of monthly figures come out for August. So we'll wait and see what they are, but that's my prediction. We'll see whether I'm right or wrong. Uh, these figures are a little bit misleading because they show they don't take into account the participation rate of those people who, who lost their jobs but are not looking for a new job. So watch this space, basically, when, uh, you know, the lock, as the lockdowns continue. The labour sector, um, this is the, the labour price index uh, on a national basis. And you can see there that the private sector uh, started to, to pick up very, very strongly. Public sector was pretty much the same. And overall, uh, you know, we started to see a, an increase in the price index. So again, watch this space. Um, when, when we have wage uh, increases, I mean, let's go back to, to when uh, December, when we were very bullish and, and uh, you know, had great confidence in the early part of the year when we had that big budget and lots of, lots of splash of cash and all of that kind of stuff. Um, what happened was, and particularly in the construction industry, we had a shortage of labour. Now, when you have a shortage in labour, the, the price of labour goes up. So wages went up and they seem to go up across the board, but particularly in the private sector. And a large percentage of that was in the construction industry. The sector that actually went down was the public sector. So uh, the wages in the public sector went down. Now, even though they've gone up, I think these lockdowns will cause a little bit of a slowing there because uh, unemployment will start to come up a little bit as well. So the wage rises uh, that you're seeing on this chart, I don't think are a long-term uh, Oh, sorry, I don't think are, are a medium term trend. I think they will cool for a bit before they go up. So certainly nothing to look at from an inflationary perspective and the Reserve Bank in, increasing interest rates. It's it's not a it's not something that's going to uh, going to continue for long, in my opinion. Let's have a look at commodities and the commodity boom that we've been having. Well, we've actually started to see a little bit of a turnaround in that as well. You can see here that the uh, the iron ore price has plummeted and so too has the copper price. Conversely, the aluminium price has actually gone up. What's going on here? Well, there's a big story, particularly when it comes to iron ore, and it goes back to the feud that we're having with China. China's come out and slashed steel exports specifically to Australia by 50% to wean itself off the nation's uh, iron ore industry. So we've been talking about this for some time. The big boys and you know have have been banging heads and they've they've started to uh, you know to China's not going to take any of our coal and they're not going to take our wines and they're not going to take our beef and they're not going to take our our lobsters and whatever else so it's a you know but iron ore has been the things that the thing that they've needed so they've actually sat back and said well we don't like Australia anymore so we are going to really jump on anything that is a strength in Australia and one of the strengths of course has been our iron ore industry particularly when you go back to this chart here and you can see go back to you know April May June July just how hugely the iron ore price spiked and uh that that has caused a a you know big profits for a, for the Australian iron ore industry 
But China's looked at that and says, well, we don't want Australia to be doing well off our back. So we're going to cut our exports of steel. Now, look, if you look at this from a bigger perspective, I'm actually um, slightly encouraged, let's say, by this, because I've been saying for a long, long time, Australia needs to be strong in Australian manufacturing where the industry is capital intensive. Now, why? Because if we're labor intensive, our cost of labor is high compared to a lot of other countries. Um, we do really good quality. And a machine running in Australia is just as efficient as a machine running in China or anywhere else in the world. So we need to start putting um, money back into manufacturing in this country that is capital intensive. And even if it's supported by the federal government, you know, they can't do much else, but at least they can support, you know, the, 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 um, the manufacturing industry. And that would have a very, very good long term impact on Australia, on the country, on jobs, on everything. So again, we could we could wallow in fear and going, oh my goodness, Australia's going to go broke because we're not going to sell any more iron ore. Or we can look at it and go, we need steel. So let's stop importing it from China who, who buys our iron ore and then sells steel back to us at 15 times the price. Let's put the money into manufacturing here in Australia. Let's employ people here in capital intensive industries where we can be strong again. And let's not rely on China. So you can either look at the positives on it, you can look at the opportunity that sits there, or you can get all caught up in the fear and hysteria and lock yourself in your room and have depression and shut down your immune system and you know be vulnerable to everything that's going around. It's your choice. It's our choice. It's the government's choice. I hope somebody in the government's listening to this enough to actually say, hey, let's do that. You know, let's throw some money in that direction. Let's private enterprise. This is a great opportunity to be able to do this stuff. Anyway, that's my opinion. A little bit of an iron ore update. Iron ore prices have experienced a huge crash with a whopping, uh, I can't read that figure because it's off my charts, a whopping 40% drop in the last month alone, falling from a high of $233 US, which is 325 Australian a tonne, to below 130 US, 181 Australian. With China accounting for up to 75% of the world's iron ore imports, Australia's most valuable export commodity has been hit hard by new policies introduced by China, including cutting uh, steel outputs. Australia made a record breaking 149 billion from iron ore exports last financial year as its price surged, but the economy could be set to, uh, to miss out on a boom as China uh, makes moves to cut its reliance on iron ore and iron ore specifically from Australia. So, you know my views on that. Let's just do it here. Great. They don't want to talk to us. They don't want to play with us. Let's play in our own backyard. We've got plenty to play with here. Let's talk about the property market. Now, the property market is not experiencing any downturn. In fact, it's the reverse. The pandemic uh, property sales defy the odds with strong results in all markets. So even in in Melbourne, which um, surprisingly, if you look at Sydney, Sydney's, Sydney's auction prices have auction clearance rates haven't gone down at all. Melbourne's have dipped a little bit, uh, and the rest of the country is just chugging along as per normal. Here's some figures that came out uh, during the week from um, ANZ, and it actually looks at the uh, the housing forecast across the capital cities, and you can see there, 2021 is is huge. Look, it's way off the chart. The, the growth that we are experiencing in 2021 and continue to do so through the rest of this year is expected to be extreme. But look at the dark blue line, and this goes across all the cities. Even though it's not as high as 2021, it's as high or higher in some cases than if you go back to 2020 or 2019 or 2018. Look at those light blue figures across the states. You know, they they were down. And that's, that's what I was talking about when APRA stuck their nose in and uh, killed the economy, particularly from a property perspective. Uh, prices went down. They went down across Australia. They went down in Sydney. They went down in Melbourne. They went down in Perth. They went down in Darwin. 
Um, Brisbane was only slightly up. Adelaide was up a little bit and Canberra was up a little bit more and Hobart went up quite well. Then you get to the greeny coloured one of 2019 and with the exception of Perth and Darwin, they flipped into the positives quite, quite nicely. Then you go 2020, across Australia, prices still went up. Sydney went up, Brisbane went up, Adelaide went up a lot, Perth went up, Hobart went up, Darwin went up a lot, Canberra went up a lot. And then you go to 2021, which is not finished yet, but the forecast is just look at that. It's like, it's more than double what we've experienced beforehand in most of the cases, with the exception of Perth. You know, sometimes it's three times what we're normally experiencing. And then the forecast in the dark blue for 2020 is still good, still above what we saw in 2019, particularly for places like Perth and Darwin, which were negative in those years. So you haven't got time to muck around. You haven't got time to, to sit back and procrastinate. You haven't got time to do any of that stuff. You've got to, you've got to take action. <laughs> you just, you know, we're in for this upward swing and you've got to be part of it. If you don't, you're going to get left behind and you will be outpriced out of the market and you will, you know, it'll be harder. The longer you leave it, the harder it's going to be. And I don't want to see that for any of my listeners. You know, you, you're listening to me because you want to be in property. You, you're listening to me because you want a better life. You're listening to me because you want to see what's going on in the property market. Well, you can't waste any more time. And, and the smarter you are, the more you know, the better results you're going to get. The more opportunities you have to get into property, not just the normal way, but in a lot of alternative ways as well, creative ways, that's where you've got to be. And, you know, if, if you're sitting on the fence, you're dithering around and you're not part of the I Love Real Estate community in, you know, and you're coming to boot camps, I've got a boot camp coming up shortly, you you need to do so. And the, the start of that, you need to be talking to one of my advisors, at least look at the opportunities that are ahead of you. Look at your goals. What are they doing? Where, where are you heading? What do you want to make happen? And uh, they can talk to you. The, the sessions are free. They're 60 minutes long. They're free. And all you've got to do is go to iloverealestate.tv forward slash questions forward slash and you can get one of those uh, those appointments. And it's it, you haven't got time to muck around. You know, you need to be part of that that those lines there. You need to be part of the, the light grey and you need to be part of the dark blue because if you leave it till the dark blue, you know, you, you've missed out on all of that growth. In the uh, last three months to July, Australian properties typically took 20, 29 days to sell. Now that is very much a seller's market compared to 51 days over the previous period of the same period in 2020. So you can see the figures there. Um, and uh, in, each, in each state, um, in each city, major capital city, you can see how long it took to actually uh, sell a property. Look at Hobart, 12.5 days. That's crazy stuff. The total stock advertised, <clears> then <throat> this is the big problem, we haven't got enough stock, 27.1% below the five-year average. And this is a combination of what's happened with APRA back in 2017 and the, and the accumulative effect of that and what's happening right now with people in fear and, and um, you know, hanging on and, um, and not, uh, not being able to move forward because they're stuck. Um, we just simply don't have the flow. My son put his put his house on the market. It's a property that he's it's a, a, a property that he's been working on and improved the value on, and uh, he put it on the market on a Tuesday at a price that is what I thought was very high, and uh, and he sold it on the Saturday. <laughs> wow! Yeah, wow. Um, clearance rates haven't been affected uh, across the board. Melbourne has. Melbourne has come back. Clearance rates in Melbourne have been lower than they ever have been. Well, not ever have been, but lower than they have been previously. Sydney clearance rates, and they've been in lockdown for you know quite a long time now, haven't budged. Clearance rates in Sydney are still doing really, really well. Uh, there was a survey came out during the week about mortgage stress because that's the obvious thing. Oh, I'm losing my job. You know, all these houses are going to be sold off cheap because people can't afford them. There'll be mortgage in possessions and whatever else. Well, certainly not happening right now. In fact, because of the low interest rates, what we're seeing is across the board, um, at risk mortgages have gone down by 17.3%. Um, and extremely at risk 
um, mortgages have gone down by 11.8%. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty telling story right there. Australia's new uh, mortgage lending activity, you can see there that the investors in this last little kick up have, have started to kick into the market um, and the first home buyers have started to come, uh, come the, you know, the percentages have come down. Why? Because all of the bonuses and all of those things for first home buyers, a lot of the incentives that were put out originally have now stopped. Um, which is what you would expect, so that would fall off. But investors are now really starting to look at the market and, and uh, you know, having a big impact. Over the last six months to June, investor lending rose by 55% and has more than doubled since June last year. And lending in first home buyers fell 3%. That's that fall off that you see there, while lending to other um, owner occupiers rose by 23%. So. You're starting to see the trend and it's you know the lockdown certainly aren't affecting that. Household um, ownership compared to renting, you can see there how um, the uh, the light blue was December 20 compared to September 20, June 20 and December 19. So it's a little bit old, but what you're seeing is a big trend. The low interest rates are certainly pushing people out of, well, helping people out of the rental pool and into their own home. And there's a lot of suburbs across Australia where it is cheaper to own a property than rent a property. Now that's not new. I've lived through many of these periods before. And the one thing that follows is a massive surge in house pricing. And that's what we're seeing right now as well. Australia's owner occupied uh, new home financing has also, um, you know, it's gone up, it's taken a little bit of a, a tumble of late, but still across the board, a good news story. Private new sales, uh, you can see there again, uh, you know, we had we had a big up there at the end of last year, and that's because of all the grants that came out. Uh, then we had a big up again at the end of March, which was when the, the, the last lot of grants uh, finalised, and then it's come back to basically normal levels. This is something that, I, that has needed to happen, and this is the new approvals. So there's a lot more approvals going in, units not so much. So the big boys really haven't dug their teeth in yet. The big boys aren't going in with their their uh, their applications for high rises and things like that. They're holding back new homes, which take a much lower time to produce. So single housing, you know, normally takes about six months to twelve to uh, to ten months to build a new home. Um, they're having an immediate impact, and there's certainly a surge in those that type of housing. When it comes to units though it takes two and a half years to build an apartment building and uh, those haven't really started they they've had a little bit of a kick up but nowhere near where it needs to be to bring supply up to where demand is so again all that means is that the future for housing prices is still on the way up it's not on the way down um, and the other thing that's happening out of lockdown is people are staying at home and they're looking at their place and they, they're starting to do some renovations and additions and those sort of things. So loans for those types of, of um, you know, improvements on their homes has certainly gone up as well. And you can see a massive surge there through COVID. Vacancy rates are as low as they historically have been. Um, you can see all of them uh, are down with the exception of Melbourne, and that's really a unit story. Um, you know, apartments are oversupplied in Sid in Melbourne, sorry. They've been oversupplied in Sydney, but they seem to be taking that up nicely. In Melbourne, they're not. It's still an over oversupply situation for units, apartments, um, and certainly not the stuff you need to be you need to be looking at and buying. Um, and across the board, we're seeing falling vacancies. So, um, you know, uh, it supports the the whole story of investors getting in and higher demand for, for investment properties because the vacancy rates are so low and they are still falling. There's still a lot more people who want to rent. And you look at that and you go, well, why is that the case? You know, we haven't let anybody into the country for so long. Um, why are we seeing this this huge surge in people who want to rent? I think the story there is more about 
again, it goes back to 2017 where um, APRA killed the country and uh, we had this huge build up in demand and a lot of people were, because they couldn't get finance, were living at home, they were living in group housing, you know, um, older kids still living with their parents and eventually it comes a point in time where that's untenable and people want to get out into the property market and interest rates have been low. So that's why um, people are wanting to, to get out and, and either buy their own place or in this case, rent. And you know it's 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 a trend right through all of the capital cities. Um, not one can we see where there's there's rental relief except for Melbourne units. If you just pull that out as as one piece. Now the little tiny country that's having such a big impact on our economy right now, or a property property economy at least, is Singapore. Would you believe Singapore is buying, or the Singaporean people are buying nearly ten billion dollars of Australian real estate every year. It's this tiny little dot of a country, and they're out there uh, buying ten billion dollars um, in the last two years to July. Uh, the figure came in at, and that was all through COVID and everything else, $19.3 billion, crazy stuff. In the two years to July last year, as I said, it was it was uh, $19.3 billion. Um, and that's in court, according to the Foreign Investment Review Board, which obviously has to track all of that sort of thing. To put that into perspective, Singaporeans spent $6.1 billion more than, uh, the, that, over that same period than China did, despite Singapore's economy being about for, despite Singapore's economy being about 44 times smaller than that of China. Um, Singapore now makes up 17% of every foreign dollar spent on Australian property versus 13% for China. In fact, the country of just uh, 5.7 million people. So, you know, we're talking about a, a quarter of the people of Australia spent more on local real estate, Australian real estate, than any other country except for the US. So the US is still a big spender in, a, in Australian property, but Singapore is making a big splash. Singaporean developers are also helping bring their buyers from the Lion City to Australia. One example is luxury boutique developer Jean Yip Holdings. Um, their Perth project, and obviously Perth's very close to Singapore. If you just kind of just go straight down, it's almost in the same timeline, I think. Um, elements of uh, Carousel quickly sold out and 60% of the units were purchased by buyers from Singapore. Mr Kimmel said Australia remains a natural destination for Singaporeans who are within a short flying distance to Perth and other capital cities. The property investment was likely to only uh, rise further as travel begin to reopen. At the same time, the reprioritization of foreign investment visas by Australian federal government may encourage further uh, home buying. So truth bomb of the week. The truth bomb of the week is a little bit of fun, I thought this week, and it's really about marriage and money. There were a few statistics that came out recently. And this chart shows that the more money you've got, the less uh, the the proliferacy, pro, prolific, the less prolific um, divorces are. So you can see um, you can see on the chart there that the the richer you are, the less likely you are to actually get a divorce, which is a little bit different to what I probably thought. Until you get down to around about the two hundred thousand dollar mark income, at that point it levels out for a period of time, and then uh, you know it goes all over the place thereafter. So a uh, bit of a bit of a a, um, a scattered result there, um, and don't forget. Uh, just finishing off for the for the week. Don't forget to book one of those free sixty minute real estate breakthrough sessions with one of my advisors. They're sitting there ready for you to to make that appointment. There's only a few appointments for the week, so uh, pop it in your diary if you're lucky enough to get one of those, and make sure that you turn up because my advisor is going to be there. Don't uh, don't let the um, you know don't let the opportunity go by. It's not the time to waste time. If you're listening to this on a podcast cast, you've got to go to iloverealestate.tv forward slash questions forward slash and get yourself one of those 
uh, free 60 minute breakthrough sessions. And when you when you have the session, make sure you've got your goals very firmly um, lined out as to what they need to be and what you want to do and where you want to be in a couple of years time, because then my advisors can help you, um, you know, work through some of those goals and what it means uh, to to be part of I Love Real Estate and how we can help you with those goals. Uh, just a little bit on the the resi price index there, you know, there's there's really not a not a time to be sitting back. You can't be procrastinating right now. You really need to be taking action. You look at those those percentage of increase in house prices since the pandemic began. You don't want to miss out on any more of it, which is why you need to take up one of those appointments and uh, and get yourself sorted so that we can start to make some significant grounds in the property market. Because the better informed you are, the more you know, uh, the better decisions you're going to make and ultimately the more profits you're going to make. So that's it for me this week. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Property Investor Weekly Masterclass. I'll be back again uh, very shortly to, uh, to give you another update on what's really going on in the property market and what are the things that you need to do to maximize your position. So thanks, guys. Thanks for uh, participating in this week. Um, and thanks for joining me on the boat. <laughs> and I'll catch you again next week. Bye now.